reason for the family, so we really appreciate you being here tonight with us. Uh, there will be lots more welcomes and introductions, but without further ado, let me first ask um, Ms. Nita Lawton Misra, the Registrar of the University, to formally open and welcome you on behalf of the University. Mr. Rita Omar, Mr. Tifa Omar, Mr. Rahmat Omar, other members of the Omar family, our guest of honor, Madam Grash Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed. Having the Honorable Grash Michelle, a very powerful woman and campaign of human rights, as well as the family of the late ANC stalwart Dola Omar in our midst is a privilege second to none. On behalf of the Rector and Vice Chancellor of the University, Professor Tyron Pretorius, it is my singular honor and pleasure to welcome you tonight to the 11th annual Dola Omar Memorial Lecture. Prof. Pretorius has sent his sincere apologies as he had a prior business commitment of which he could not get out. This lecture comes at a time when it feels as if our hard-won democracy is fraying at the edges. It is indeed a difficult time for our country, as post-apartheid freedom and justice are in danger of being eroded and replaced by deeply disturbing notions of state capture and corruption. It is in our recollection of the past and our long road to freedom as stated by former President Nelson Mandela, that we must find new courage to stare down the challenges that confront us. We dare not succumb to our fears or a sense of weariness that we have been down this road before. It is imperative that we pause to reflect on the wisdom of the late Dula Omar and the principles that informed his commitment to a liberated South Africa. One, in which our constitutional democracy remains sacrosanct. In a 1998 speech to the National Council of Provinces, Dula Omar spoke of the Herculean task that he and his colleagues had undertaken to ensure that instead of 20% of South Africans accessing the justice system, every single South African enjoyed that inherent right. Then he said, and I quote, 1994 was the starting point of democratization, not the end. Nobody, neither white nor black, need to fear that process because it is inclusive, not exclusive. It involves nation building, uniting the country, ending the terrible culture of violence and corruption, redressing apartheid created imbalances and inequalities and making South Africa a better place for everyone to live in." Unquote. After the first democratic elections in 1994, Omar became the first Minister of Justice of Democratic South Africa. For him, the radical transformation of South Africa involved far more than rhetoric. Instead, it meant dismantling the unequal access to justice and taking 11 apartheid-based departments and merging it into a single one that would serve all. Dula Omar's belief in a better South Africa was as unwavering as his belief in modesty and humility. It is instructive that he shunned the trappings that could be easily accessed through his office, preferring to remain in the home where he and his wife, Farida, had raised their children. It is equally instructive to remember the role of this university during apartheid. Like Dula Omar, our students and staff remained steadfast in their pursuit of freedom and the realization of a democratic society in which every single citizen of this country would have the right to equality and dignity. It made sense, therefore, that in 1990, Dula Omar was appointed 
director of UWC's newly established Community Law Center, which aimed to research human rights, perform human rights litigation, and run community-based education programs. Equally fitting tonight is having one of our continent's most vocal advocates for human rights and dignity present her lecture in Dula Omar's name. As we take guidance and inspiration from the work and wisdom of Ms. Michelle, we remember that she has been relentless in campaigning for the rights of children and women. She has done this for most of the continent, for most of her life, both personally and through her foundation. Michelle is recognized for her dedication to educating the people of Mozambique, for her leadership in organizations that devoted itself to children of her war-torn country. She has been a major force in increasing literacy and schooling in Mozambique and has spoken of the needs and rights of children, families, and community from platforms all over the world. Her activism has not only lived in words, but through a myriad of projects to which she has given direction. And I hope she continues to inspire in those who would have remained oppressed and dispossessed. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mrs. Michelle to the University of the Western Cape and in saying thank you for being such an inspiration and for showing us that when the heart truly desires, anything is possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Lawton Mija, for that wonderful welcoming address. Um, let me also quickly acknowledge a few people that, that are here with us tonight. Um, Dr. Max Price, I saw him on the list. I don't know whether he is director of UCT. If he is here, warm well, welcome. Um, so Lydia Idranyafi, Deputy Consul General of Madagascar. Uh, His Excellency Sali Omar, the Ambassador of Eritrea. Uh, Ms. Belinda Van Heeren, Judge of the Supreme Court of Appeal. Uh, Bridget Mapandla, I don't see her, but she may or may not be here. If she is, warm well, welcome. And also some members of our advisory board, Professor Leo Mombene, Dr. Suleiman Mubarak, and Mr. Ashraf Mohammed. And anyone that I haven't mentioned, please, everyone, feel, feel welcome uh, tonight. Um, ever since we changed our name from Community Law Center to Dalla Omar Institute, uh, Dalla has become more part of our fabric uh, than ever before. Um, and we proudly carry forward his legacy of fighting for social justice and the rule of law in South Africa and across the continent. And Auntie Farida and the Omar family, we want to again say that we are humbled to, to use his name in our institute, because we also know you guard that name jealously, uh, because his name is associated with humility, integrity, and strong leadership. And let me also say, echoing the words of the registrar, that looking at our current political leadership, I think these qualities are in short supply. These are difficult times, and I think we're all a little punch drunk with all the news, ongoing news, relentless stream of news about states seemingly unable to conquer this beast of corruption. Um, a government that is not prioritizing those who need its support most. Uh, parts of the private sector in an unholy alliance with bad parts, bad elements of the state. And a ruling party that is devouring itself at great cost to the functioning of our state institutions. I had the privilege of interacting with Dalla Omar a few times in my, early on in my career at the Community Law Center. And I know he would have been, he would have been repulsed as what, about what we're seeing around us uh, because it stands in such sharp contrast to what he fought for. And I'm sure he would have urged us to not remain quiet, but to stand up and fight for our democracy. Um, on my right, there's a beautiful choir waiting in the wings, literally, to uh, render a song. And the song that we're about to listen to, uh, performed by the Pinelands High School Choir, um, directed by Simon Bethel, uh, I think speaks to the topic 
that I just spoke to. Uh, the theme song is a Zulu hymn called Ukutela, Peace in this World of Sin. Over to you guys.
you all agree with me that was truly remarkable. I think the future is right if you look at the youngsters that perform tonight. Thank you so much. And we'll hear more of them later on in the program. Mr. Rancho Marshall will now be introduced by Dr. Maria Asim, who is one of the many formidable researchers working at the Institute. She's been with us as a master's student, as a doctoral researcher, as a postdoctoral researcher, and now as a senior researcher. So she's really very smart. <laughs> Over to you, Maria. Thank you. In December of 1997, our guest speaker for tonight spoke the following words, and I would like to quote it. It is the meaning of what my life has been since my youth, to try to fight for the dignity and the freedom of my own people, end quote. She said those words during a commemorative program marking the 50th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And today, the third day of October 2017, Almost 20 years later, those words remain true <coughs> about and for our speaker tonight. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome once again to the 11th Dula Omar Memorial Lecture. Tonight's speaker is a renowned humanitarian and international advocate for the rule of law, good governance, and human rights, with a particular focus on women's and children's rights. She is also passionate about reinforcing the role of the family and the community in advancing and maintaining the cause of peace and justice. An activist since her student days, she has maintained a career as a political and social justice activist for over many decades. Beginning her career as a freedom fighter and a school teacher, she subsequently served as the newly independent Mozambique's first minister of education and culture, during which time the illiteracy rate was reduced overall by over 70%. In that portfolio also, she actively promoted peace and reconciliation in the country. Through the Foundation for Community Development, among many others, she continues to facilitate greater community access to knowledge and technology, as well as to patterns of sustainable human development in Mozambique and beyond. Her goal in all of this is to contribute towards the eradication of poverty and the achievement of social justice for all. Globally, our speaker has a long history of sterling work, both within and without the United Nations, including chairing the development of the groundbreaking UN study on the impact of armed conflict on children. Through this study, the world gained new insights into the plight of refugee children and child victims of armed conflicts generally. In recognition of this unprecedented work and its significance, she received the 1995 Nansen Medal from the United Nations, the 1997 Global Citizen Award of the New England Circle, and the 1998 North-South Prize of the Council of Europe. More recently, she has served on the United Nations Secretary General's Millennium Development Goals Advocacy Group and the high-level panel of eminent persons on the post-2015 development agenda. She is also a member of an independent group of global leaders working together for peace and human rights. This group is simply known as the Elders. See, she also chairs, among several others, the board of the Partnership for Maternal, Newborn, and Child Health, which is hosted by the World Health Organization in Geneva, Switzerland. On the African she served as an eminent person of the African Peer Review Mechanism, known as APRM of NEPAD, which means the new partnership for Africa's development. <coughs> she is a member of the African Progress Panel, a group consisting of 10 distinguished individuals from both the public and private sector who advocate for equitable and sustainable development for Africa. She is the board chair of the African Center for the Constructive Resolution of Disputes and is also an ambassador, African ambassador for UNICEF's A Promise Renewed. It is an initiative supporting the United Nations Every Woman, Every Child movement. Through the Grasso Marshall Trust, a Pan-African Advocacy Trust established in 2010, she continues to advocate for, among others, women's economic and financial empowerment, education for all, an end to child marriage, food security and nutrition, as well as a promotion of democracy 
and good governance in at least 20 countries across the continent, including here in South Africa. In addition to the Grasso Marcel Trust, our guest speaker is the co-founder of the Mandela Institute for Development Mark Studies. It's located here in South Africa and seeks to address the short, medium, and long-term development challenges in Africa and South Africa in a holistic and comprehensive manner. Its mission is to make a difference in the resolution of challenges confronting the nations through a vibrant and robust debate by interrogating current paradigms and by offering new approaches on the way forward. Through her passionate dedication to her work, our guest speaker has earned and continues to earn numerous awards and appointments, including being named the Chancellor of the University of Cape Town, President of the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London, and the Chancellor of the African Leadership University. In all the excellent work that this exceptional woman has done over the years and continues to do today, one thing stands out. This is a woman who always asks the tough questions in order to challenge the status quo. She does this by challenging the stakeholders to think through the issues and to work together towards changing or improving the situation of various groups of people. The late advocate Dula Omar, in whose memory we are gathered here tonight, is known for the same soul-searching legacy. This holds true, whether in connection to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, whose establishment he oversaw, or by laying a solid foundation for South Africa's justice system as the Democratic Nation's first Minister of Justice. We are therefore very privileged to have our distinguished guest speaker with us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, please, without further ado, join me in welcoming Madam Assange. which uh, I really doubt whether I will be able to, to meet. Farida, the Omar family, the leadership of the Bala Omar Institute, students, and more particularly, our children. Thank you for honoring this occasion and being with us tonight. I'm sure you are familiar with the lectures in this institute, which have been mostly of uh, intellectual reflection. But tonight, I'm not going to bring an, a lecture. I'm going to share some very deep concerns I have. and. Uh, hoping that uh, at the end, all of us will see ourselves as having a space and a role to play to face those challenges. This is what activists do. I chose the thing for tonight, a call for a soul searching and nations soul searching. And I'll start by reminding ourselves of uh, the very basic rules in which our system stands on. The Freedom Chapter was the statement of core principles of the South African Congress Alliance, which consisted of the African National Congress and its allies, 
the South African Indian Congress, the South African Congress of Democrats, and the Colored People's Congress. This is very important, particularly for the younger ones, to know how the birth of the Freedom Chapter was really a collective, a collective coming together of different people in our nation. Adopted at the Congress of the Peoples in 1955, it stands as a reminder of the vision behind a people-led, human rights-based vision for a new South Africa. And I'm going to quote. We, the people of South Africa, declare for all our country and the world to know that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black and white, and no government can justly claim authority unless it is based on the will of all the people. That our people have been robbed of their birthright to land, liberty, and peace by a form of government founded on injustice and inequality, that our country will never be prosperous or free until all our people live in brotherhood, enjoying equal rights and opportunities, that only a democratic state based on the will of all the people can secure to all their birthrights without a distinction of color, race, sex, or belief. And therefore, we, the people of South Africa, black and white together equals, can freedom And we pledge ourselves to strive together sparing neither strength and courage until the democratic changes here set out have been won, unquote. Our constitution lays out the blueprint of a new equitable South Africa. Again, I'll quote, we the people of South Africa recognize the injustice of our past honor those who suffered for justice and freedom in our land, respect those who have worked to build and develop our country, and believe that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, united in our diversity. We therefore, through our freely elected representatives, adopted this constitution as the supreme law of the Republic, so as to, and I'd like to underline this, so as to heal the divisions of the past and establish a society based on the democratic values, social justice, and fundamental human rights. Lay the foundations for a democratic and open society in which government is based on the will of the people and every citizen is equally protected by law, improve the quality of life of all citizens and free the potential of each person and build a united and democratic South Africa able to take its rightful place as a sovereign state in the family of nations. May God protect our people. I stand here today along with the memory of that very gentle but giant soul of advocate Dalla Oma and the principles of justice and equality he stood for, urging us not to spare the strength and courage required to collectively soul search and move us closer to the South Africa enshrined 
in the dreams of our Freedom Charter and Constitution. This evening, we are honoring him as he embodied these values we hold so dear and dedicated his life in service to realizing these ideals. As a nation, we were spared the ravages of civil war as the apartheid regime was dismantled. And we made a relatively peaceful transition to a democratic state. But today, we are at war with ourselves and with each other. We are plagued with deeply entrenched and festering wounds. The most visible manifestation of these wounds can be found in our violent and equal society. I'm going to deal with this in three approaches, starting by violence, a society at war with itself. In this country we call our home, brutal violence visits us in our streets and in our homes on a daily basis. Media reports of smash and grabs, kidnapping of young women, horrific gender-based viol gender violence cases, brutal xenophobic attacks, cyberbullying, service delivery riots, and political assassinations are commonplace on the reeds. We are at war with each other and with our institutions. I'll first speak of the violence we visit upon ourselves, on our children, our youth, our women, our elderly, and our immigrants. And then I will turn to our violent outcry against our institutions. Violence against children. Madiba rightly said, I quote, there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its children, unquote. Children are the most precious, the most revered gift any society has and is the bearer of its future. Any society vested in its own progress must ensure its children are protected and nurtured. Curiously, some sections of South Africans show little regard and value for its youngest generations. UCT released South Africa's first study on the national annual incidence of child sexual abuse in the country last year, and its findings were shocking. It found that one in every three young South Africans have experienced some form of sexual abuse in their lives. This number translates into the population of Port Elizabeth and twice that of Bloemfontein. Boys reported higher lifetime prevalence rates of sexual abuse, abuse around 37% than girls, which would be about 30, 34%. Unlike previously thought, we thought that girls are more than boys. However, the nature of the abuse is often different. Girls are more likely to experience contact sexual abuse where they are physically violated and boys are more likely to experience exposure abuse where the child is forced to see sexual images or acts. We have been shocked by news reports of infants as young as nine months, two years old being raped. In schools and in their homes where they are supposed to be find, to find sanctuary and to be safest, children of all ages are victims of unspeakable violence. They suffer sexual violence 
at the hands of fellow students and sometimes of teachers. Abuse of power by principals and teachers in schools has made our classrooms and bathrooms unsafe for our pupils. For adolescents, physical bullying is commonplace and now cyberbullying has become fashionable with girls being <laughs> slut-shamed on WhatsApp groups, Facebook group timelines, and the Twitter feeds. There are well-known cases of posts going viral on social media of gang rapes and sexual assaults on schools grounds. High prevalence of teenage pregnancy with around 30% of 15 to 19 years old reporting having ever been pregnant. According to the 2015 annual school survey, over 15,000 people became pregnant during the academic year. I'm saying in one year only, 15,000 uh, people becoming pregnant, many as a result of abusive encounters. Any pregnancy posts health risks to the mother and the child, make it more challenging for a girl to complete her education and reach her academic and professional potential, and put significant financial and emotional strain on family members. Not only are children and adolescents victims of sexual and physical abuse in alarming numbers, they are dying at the hands of adults at astonishing, astonishing rates. Right here in Cape Town, in 2016, at Salt River Mortuary alone, at least 30 children were killed in their home due to child abuse and neglect. Every three days, a child is killed due to abuse and neglect. The child murder rates in South Africa is more than double the global average. Over the past decade, almost 10,000 children have been murdered. Nearly 900 children were murdered in South Africa from 2015 and 16 alone. The Institute of Race Relations has revealed in the 2017 survey report. The value of a child's life, their protection and well-being need to be our paramount concern as a society. As adults, it is our obligation to treat them with respect, instill in them the value of life and the sanctity of their bodies, reverence for authority and empathy for their fellow human beings. These values can only be modeled by love, care, and nurturing that we pour into them. When they grow up experiencing hostility, exploitation, and abuse, it then becomes no wonder that they grow up devoid of a moral compass and react violently to their circumstances in life. It should come as no surprise that many of our young people do not have respect for each other. Figures of authority or adults in general respect for their parents, the elderly, the police, or the government officials. Having been socialized in a culture of violence, a natural tendency will be to operate in the world from a place of aggression and physical combativeness. We see this play out in young adulthood and beyond through gang violence, date rape, road rage, and bar brawls. It is most extreme form, in its most extreme form, when a society has lost its sense of boundaries and limitation and has little respect for human life, what results is the visceral violence attached to what in other countries is limited to petty crime. For example, home invasions and car theft, theft escalate quickly here into kidnapping, rape, and murder. Speaking of murder, 
from 2015-16, over 18,500 murders were recorded, which amounts to an average of 51 killings daily. In this country, 51 people are murdered every 24 hours. These astounding statistics make South Africa one of the most violent societies in the world and a particularly dangerous one for its young people, its women, and its elderly. Let me now move to violence against women. Women are under attack daily in South Africa. 40% of men assault their partners daily. 40%, almost half. A woman dies at the hands of her intimate partner every eight hours, which translates into three women being killed by their loved ones every single day. It is reported that more women are killed by her current or former partner here than in any other country in the world. According to the Victims of Crime Survey data, Report, uh, reported, a uh, report, I'm sorry, released by Stats South Africa. Most of these crimes are likely to occur either in the home and amongst people who know each other and with the influence of either alcohol or drugs. This implies that regardless of whatever crime strategies the police adopt, many of these crimes will continue to occur unless behavior and value change takes place in society. Violence against elderly. Any society that does not cherish and protect its most precious children, women, and elderly is a sick society. Elderly South Africans are regularly exposed to harm and violence. The elderly experience neglect, sexual abuse, home invasions, and theft at unacceptably high levels. Alarming rates of brutality against the elderly, particularly for men in their communities, turn often defenseless caregivers and matriots into victims of horrific violence, rape, sexual grouping, and assault of elderly family members is often accompanied by the use of drugs and alcohol of the perpetrators. It is encouraging to see a recent push in tougher legislation in the form of life sentences for men who rape elderly women and having sexual assaults of elder, older persons being treated as harshly as the rape of minors and the disabled. But much needs to be done to protect those who should be living in their golden years. This phenomenon is a signal of the decay of our moral fiber and the absolute minimum regard we have for each other as human beings, as well as an indication of how broken our community policing and protection mechanisms <coughs> in our cities and villages are. Violence against the other, the foreigner. We have not only turned against our own, but towards those who have found a refuge in this country as well. Waves of xenophobic attacks in 2000, 2008, 2013, and 2015 saw the killing of foreign nationals from Nigeria, Zimbabwe, Kenya, Somalia, Pakistan, Ethiopia, and Mozambique. This violence, while seemingly a reaction to economic inequality and perceived threat to livelihood, is also a manifestation of Afrophobia and the lack of value and connection we have to others from our same continent. Many of these countries played a significant role in the liberation of this country, and we have repaid their generosity with Malis, making our borders unsafe and unwelcoming to them. Indeed, we are a nation at war with itself.
at war with our fellow citizens, as I have just explained, and at war with our institutions. And this is what I'm going to now. There's still a commonly accepted notion that violent protest as an acceptable reaction to state action or inaction, as the case may be. Service delivery protests and strikes, for example, often turn violent. Municipal IQ, a web-based data service that monitors hotspots, says 86% of service delivery protests on its radar were characterized by violence in 2016 alone, 86% in one year. Burning, looting, stoning, and destruction of property are commonplace. There's also a severe mistrust between law enforcement and communities. Instead of peaceful means of conflict resolution from Marikana to Limpopo, we see police turn against citizens. They were meant to serve and protect with the rubber bullets and the live ammunition. Educational institutions have also become a target of violence. Students with legitimate demands around free and accessible education, for example, should not feel they have to turn to violence by burning libraries and destroying property to have the demands met. While citizens should and have the right to protest and demand change, the first and immediate reaction in the form of violent protest should not be the normal cause of action. We have inherited a violent past and legacy of disregard for authority. As a society, it is clear we have normalized violence and we have yet to unlearn how to interact with each other from a space of aggression. We live in a climate of culture of hostility and violence that needs to be seriously dealt with. As legal scholars and academics, you understand much better that I, than I, the attitude South Africans have towards each other. The law, the criminal justice system, and you are well placed to change these forces to ensure that the values of our constitution, which call for us to live in peace, bear fruit. Let me touch quickly on the socioeconomic inequalities. While we put in place a system of governance to replace our old political framework and gave great thought to our political institutions, we did not give the same consideration to revamping our socioeconomic landscape. We created mechanisms, however imperfect, to address the economic imbalances of the past. Clearly, more work needs to be done in this regard as economic inequality is still a significant problem. The gap between rich and poor is one of the widest in the world, with the richest to 1% of the population owning 42% of the country's wealth. We have yet to dismantle the contempt breeding special inequalities that apartheid created either. The stark dichotomy between Alexander Township and Sandton City, Olanga and Camps Bay is heartbreaking and unacceptable this far into our new dispensation. For as imperfect as our political and economic transformation has been, our social transformation is woefully lagging, but we did not do the same soul searching and brainstorming to reconfigure how we live and operate as a harmonious society. Perhaps I want to explain this a little bit better. South Africa has a political agenda of transformation. South Africa has, although it's imperfect, the BE and BEE, which is an approach to transfer part of wealth to 
those who did not have anything. So we, we took time to think about it and to put in place some mechanisms. But what I'm raising is that we did not take the same approach to transforming ourselves as a human beings, to transform the way we relate to one another, the way we relate within our families, within our communities, and of course, as a nation. And because we do not have this, the tendency is that when we are faced with the challenges, we believe that is law enforcing institutions which should be strengthened to deal with the human relations. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. I mean, law enforcing institutions have a very important role, but what we have to sit down and discuss how do we learn to look at a child and respect the sanctity of this child. Never, never an adult could look at a child and think of violating her. And that has nothing to do with the law. It has to do with attitude and behavior. When we have, in one day, three women being killed inside the homes by people who have ever said that they love these women, it's not a police issue. It's not a, a, a justice issue. It's an issue of how men and women relate to one another and accept that a woman has to be loved, cared for, respected. And even when there are differences, dialogue is the solution. You don't beat a woman and you don't kill a woman simply because you have differences in the home. There's no police which is going to be in every single home to protect those who love each other. So my problem and my concern tonight is I know that public institutions are totally imperfect, but I want to bring it to us as human, as people. What do we have to do to learn? to respect and to value each other. Moral degeneration. State capture and corruption have taken over our news headlines. We feel betrayed by some who we have elected to lead and govern us with responsibility, accountability, and respect for the Constitution yet opted to put themselves and their coffers ahead of the well-being of the country and the people. Again, the response to the challenge of nation building and governance has been violence. Intimidation and political rivalry have become destabilizing and escalated to the point where in KwaZulu-Natal, for example, political assassinations have become shockingly commonplace. Since March 2014, there have been over 90 politically motivated killings in the province. Just a few days ago in East London, a political conference ended in bloodshed and mayhem, with the police firing stun grenades and dispersed a crowd of violent delegates. We see also exploitative pastors enriching themselves at the expense of their followers, preying on the vulnerable by seducing their congregations to leave large donations, to give large donations to the church in return for miracles and spiritual proximity to God. Very often these church leaders live in opulence while their congregants struggle to meet and to make and meet. We have also heard of recent deranged and violently harmful acts of so-called worship and sacrifice in Houting and in Popo, such as eating snakes and grass or drinking petrol for cleaning the territory. There are also widespread stories of inappropriate sexual behavior by church leaders right here in Cape Town as well. 
those we have entrusted our well-being, whether in meeting rooms, classrooms, or churches or places of worship, are not all leading with a sense of ethics and morality. We need a plan of redress for our social ills. A treatment plan for our broken society so that we heal, we heal from our divisions and they are united in our diversity as well as respectful of the human dignity and the rights of all our citizens. We need to rewire ourselves so that the natural response to the challenges we face is not violent and so that the challenges we experience are not so deeply rooted in the inequities and the trauma of the past. Perhaps Ubuntu can be a framework for healing. And I'm sure you have heard this before. And I don't want to bring Ubuntu as if it is a panacea. But we need to articulate and internalize and institutionalize what it means to build and be a South Africa that is embracing of its diversity at peace with itself and dedicated to ensuring equality for all. The philosophy of Ubuntu perhaps is a good starting point and framework for our soul searching and healing of our broken, disconnected state and society. We need to connect with ourselves and with each other. The notion of Ubuntu is underpinned by the recognition that a person is a person through other person. Our humanity is affirmed through the recognition of other. That's why we say, I am because you are. The respect for human dignity is an obligation and condition for being human. To be human, the condition is to respect and to accept the other human. The interconnectedness and interdependency of our humanity makes such ills as violence against women, racial discrimination, and oppression difficult to accept and institutionalize. In conclusion, I look to you, UWC, and particularly this institute, which has been named after one of the stellar sons of this continent, to take the responsibility as you have been in the past called, this is the university of the left. I'm calling on you to spearhead the process of societal transformation. You are well poised to lead a movement of stellar social scientists, academic institutions, research bodies to conduct more knowledge on unpacking our wounded psyche and mental health and suggesting mechanisms that will lead to our collective and individual healing. Please identify strategies and build a movement that will enable us to heal individually and collectively and repair our brokenness. Please help us to make out, map out where we go from here. It's not enough to acknowledge. It's the first step to acknowledge. So what do we do? And who else can help us to know what to do than social scientists who can research, they can give us the framework, and then, as a starting point, 
we firstly need healing at the macro level within our hearts and minds as individuals, within our families. The, I can't underscore more the importance of the family, where the values of relationship, of human relationship are being molded. It's in our own families. And no one can replace the responsibility of the family, particularly in protecting and nurturing the little ones. But we need to do this also from family to our neighborhoods and our communities. So we can then transform and heal in our schools, in our places of worship, in our workplaces. I'm bringing the responsibility to us individually and collectively so that we don't continue the attitude which many times we say, the government is failing, if somebody else is failing, and we don't take responsibility that in human relations, it's all of us, it's each and every one of us. And that's why I'm saying the soul searching. The soul searching as individuals, as communities, and the social institutions in which we are. We have to do it. We have no choice. We will never have a healthy society if we are not healthy individuals. And if we do not live in peace with ourselves, we'll be always at war with somebody else. So please utilize your intellectual capital and build coalitions amongst your networks of other centers of excellence like this one to help define for us the architecture of a society that we need to build and live so that we live together peacefully as equals and fully embracing of all our rich diversity. Without serious soul searching and an operating framework for us to live into and transform the way we self and collectively identify and relate to one another in the spirit of Ubuntu, we will continue to be unhealthy and will be involved in this spiral of death and violence. So I end here, hoping that I'll hear from the University of Western Cape, from this institute, the beginning of a social movement which is not like me, I'm a social activist. I can say things, but I do not know how to deal with, with those things to heal mentally and emotionally. You have the tools, and it is your time to give us that architecture, that framework around which individually, family, communities, schools, places of worship, places, workplaces, wherever we are together, we'll be able to lick our wounds, heal, and become the society which Dalla Omar and many others. They dreamed of, and actually, they left us with the institutions which are the pillars of a democratic society. Now, the task is ours. Thank you very much.
I had forgotten that there's a space for questions, so. Can I have a glass of water, please? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much for those for those words. I think they. Uh, they paint a, a bleak picture, a harrowing picture, uh, but they also inspire us. Um, and they challenge all of us uh, in terms of how we need to move forward. Um, and I think what was particularly remarkable about your work is that as uh, the university and the Dalla Omar Institute, we often look at institutions, how do we fix institutions, how do we stop corruption? Mm -hmm. How do we change the law? Um, and you say, no, it is about human relations. It is about how we interact with each other, how we bring humanity back mm -hmm. and, and embrace the value of Ubuntu. Um, it also, I think, um, brings me to one of the great legacies of Tala Omar, it's been through the Reconciliation Commission. Exactly. Which was one mm -hmm. of these mm -hmm. unique combinations mm -hmm. of law, justice, and humanity mm -hmm. in a, a process mm -hmm. that um, was again imperfect. And, and there are lots of challenges that still remain, but nevertheless played a crucial part in, 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 in the early transition. So I think there are lots of, lots of threads um, from your, your speech um, and your challenge to us and, and the legacy of the Omar that we're trying to, to uphold. But I think challenges to us to look at what is it that we can do Mm -hmm. at our workplace, in our offices, uh, in the lecture halls, uh, in classrooms, um, in our families, mm -hmm. at home, churches, other places of worship. Those are the contexts within which we can place, uh, we can pursue and, and bring to light the words that you like to share with us tonight. So thank you very much. It was truly really rich. Should I move down there? I think we can maybe take a seat here. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Mrs. Michelle is kindly agreeing to take one or two questions um, to you know, take the debate further. Um, and so I would like to invite anyone who wants to ask a question to, to come forward. A few rules. Uh, unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen of the media, uh, this is not your opportunity, unfortunately. I know that many of you have lots of questions. I'm sure you. Um, but we really want this to be an opportunity for our students and, and for anyone else who is here in attendance to ask a question. Do please keep your questions short uh, and focus it on, on the lecture. Uh, I'm sure there's lots of other questions that we have that we would seek Professor Marshall's counsel on, but we would like to take the, the discussion further on the, um, on, the, on the speech itself and briefly state your name and the organization that you represent, if applicable, uh, so that we can take your questions. So let me take two or three questions. I'm going to insist on three questions, and two of them must be women. So uh, I'm looking at you are number one, and then where's my second woman? Yes. Uh, where is she? There we go. Yes, please. You are number two. And then number three, let me see there at the back. You are number three. So number one, please go ahead, and uh, I'm sure there are roaming mics that we can bring to you. So we have three ladies, two ladies, and then a gentleman at the back. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, um, good afternoon, um, Madam Krashen Michelle. It's truly a pleasure to have you speaking here with us today. Um, my name is Ijoma Opara. Um, I'm currently a master's student at the University of Cape Town. Um, doing my master's in international relations, specifically looking at Boko Haram and the gendered violence that occurs within that. Um, the question that I have for you, um, um, Madame Gresham Michelle, particularly what stuck out to me from the lecture you gave was how we can take the, the violences that occur on a macro to a micro level. And one of the things that I was thinking about specifically was how we can connect the youth and the conversations that we are having to different generations. So the question that I have or the thought that, that I want to put out there is how can we bridge 
what seems to be an inter intergenerational gap that exists between the youth, not only amongst school children, but also amongst fellow students I have at my university, and also with older generations that I talk to where there seems to be a, a lack of commonality and understanding about some of the pertinent issues on the continent. Relating not only um, economically but socially, and, and how do we grapple with these macro issues that are, we are grappling with on the continent on a micro level, but also within our communities and in spaces where we want to talk to elders and we want to have conversations between different generations. Thank you. Question number two. Uh, I'm Dorothea Hendricks from UWC, psychologist. Thank you, Mama Krasa. Um, I would like to just hear on a personal level from you and from Mama Farida, if that's possible, just one or two things, practices you have to let the younger generation in your family feel validated and practices that have been special to you. And then I'd like to invite each of you to choose a young person to answer the same question because their voices and what is special to us as well and to them is quite important. Thank you. Thank you. Question number three there at the back. Um, good evening, Madam Brock Michelle, Honorable. Um, Professor Jacques, um, Professor MC, I think I should actually show you since we are the Faculty of Law. I do not conform to any gender. I'm gender non-conforming. That's the hashtag I'm having in the New South Africa. I think the LGBTI sector for fighting for my rights on that privilege. But I do can be a woman as well. Um, Mama Graka Michelle, I believe it takes a village to raise a child. And that child is born of a woman. I am coming from an area whereby we are rated as key population people. We are the people that you will see that are homeless on the streets of Cape Town, of Johannesburg, and of Durban, all these CBD cities. Um, you'll find us laying down there on the streets. I'm representing those people. I'm representing groups who are HIV positive and who seem that there is no hope at the end of the tunnel. And you find that within the organizations I operate in, you are told that the funding is not allocated for this certain person because they do not belong here. But at the end of the day, that is still a woman who have given birth to a human being who, he, who she carried for nine months. How could we merge these NGOs whereby we have one unity amongst us all. In our core fight of that, it takes a village to raise a child. As NGOs across on a national level, I think they should merge and become a village. So I'd like to have knowledge on that and to interact with community, get the mothers out there, get church leaders out there to be part of our discussions and know that it's the emotional abuse that they cause us that tarnish the heart. And the heart, you do not use a cotton and needle to mend, but it takes years and years of replenishment. I thank you. Thank you. Those questions were, were nice and short, so that enables us to take a few more. I think we can, we can do that. Um, I see more hands. Let us see um, the gentleman there. You are number three now. And then number four, you are very eager, so you are number five. Number four, number five. Can we bring a mic to that gentleman? Get away. Thank you, thank you. Hello, Mama Krasa. I think we want to speak on violence. So address the violence in UTMBC first, the broken house, the broken family. The financial exclusion of students that's happening yearly to the UC. The violence of students being homeless for a year. But the management of the institution has the financial resources to, to give house to the students. It speaks about that violence. 
the speak about the violence that this institution has caused 143 workers that they've unfairly dismissed, they've stripped one income in a family. Can you speak on that violence? They speak on violence that the UWC has done to student activists that they able to incinerate students and just become a daily breakfast while they're not breakfast in residence for students to go to court each and every morning. They speak on violence that institution has caused to our sisters. Let's never forget the violence that's happening in MU today. The MU is on fire. Forte is on fire because the youth is still growing, it's still car trying for institutional of free education. But now, Mamudra sir, my plea is one. Before you move a strategy for UWC to help the nation, let's first help itself. Dula Omar speaks of TRC. We plead for a TRC at UWC. We plead, Mama Trasha Mashal, in, in the resources that you have to be able to facilitate a TRC at UWC. Because the institution is a black is a broken institution. It cannot produce any leaders because it because it, it prisons their leaders. The same institution that the SRC president of the institution was sent to go to prison for 21 days. For he there he cried for the struggle of the workers. The struggle of one for the three families that now have no bread to eat. There's no breakfast in their homes. The only thing that they know is countless system cases that proves that the justice system of this, of this country has failed students. Amutra so will spill, bleed to be the mother of the nation, do what Samara Michelle should have done for this nation. Think what will he say when he sees the student activist who try for one man call for decolonial education, that the academics today are using it to benefit for themselves, but those who preach about it, who fought about it, they've got nothing, the only thing that they know is caught and protect victimization. We believe with you, Mahmoud Rasha, all the provinces in this country, the leaders of this nation, are in jail. The only thing they know is caught and suspensions. We believe for a national TRC, if there this nation could forgive the court, how can it not forgive its children? If the University Institute of the Western Cape speaks about the terrorist state change this nation, how they it continues to victimize its own students? Speak and plea for the terrorist Thank you, my brother. Thank you. And then after that, we wrap it up. Can you please keep it short, gentlemen? We are going towards the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mama Rasha Michelle. Uh, for that uh, wise words and for educating us once again. I'll be as brief as possible. I, I think uh, this sort of uh, culture of hypocrisy and, and apathy has evolved uh, around uh, our dignitaries, our leaders, uh, etc. And uh, unfortunately, we can't uh, condone it. Uh, it's also, we could also argue that uh, it's, it's, it's a question of patriotism that is, is, is actually coming into, is being put into, uh, that, that's coming into place here, that's patriotism, patriotism being questioned, our loyalty towards Africa, uh, towards the people of Africa itself, itself, but also, as you mentioned, uh, the soul-searching uh, uh, method uh, we could argue it's a sort of having to do some sort of read, uh, some sort of introspection within ourselves, uh, which I fundamentally agree with. However, though, uh, uh, Mama Michelle, exploitation within the workplace in South Africa is, is, is still a huge matter that needs to be addressed. Uh, huge racial discrimination that occurs within the workplace, exploitation people working hard uh, and still being uh, underpaid by the capitalist system. And uh, our government actually having agreed, I think, in, uh, if I'm correct, in 2016, that uh, a 3,500 rand minimum wage 
is is okay, uh, and that was actually ratified. So also, just to just to conclude, uh, racism, uh, tribalism uh, in South Africa, you know, this whole kind of thing that that that, that we also need to look at. Uh, that is actually sort of as much as culture is supposed to unite uh, the people of, of the African continent and the diaspora, it is sort of actually hindering, uh, to a large extent, hindering Africa's process. Um, I will uh, conclude, I will pause there for now, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I have to say this. Perhaps I can go there. Because it's, it's easier when I'm standing. Uh, well, some of, the, uh, some of the people were not asking questions. They were making comments, which I have taken note. But I don't think really I would be in a position to uh, respond to all, because they're just part of uh, enriching the, the debate. But I think it comes, uh, again, to say those who have to change whatever the challenges we have, it's ourselves. We have to take responsibility for that. Anyway, you, someone started, the young lady started with the intergenerational conversation. How do we promote this? I think we just have to start where we are. If you are in a university, invite somebody you believe you'd like to have a conversation with. Because I have had many opportunities in which, informally, not in a session like this, informally, I'm asked to share my life experience with young people, which I do with a lot of pleasure, because it's not only about what I have lived through, it's mostly to allow me to understand young people. Because I'm no longer young. I ceased to be young a long time back. <laughs> so if I have to be relevant in this society, I have really to understand the world which is yours, which is different from the world in which I grew up. So there is a mutual enrichment in these intergenerational conversations. But sometimes it's difficult to know who is willing to and where. So my response to you young people, just to take initiative to invite whoever you believe it would be interesting to interact with. Of course, as a collective, because you can't do it individually. So whether you are in a, a, a student uh, movement, whether you are in your uh, church community, when I say church, I mean religious uh, community, because uh, not every, everything is a church. It can be new mosque, wherever you are. I think we just have to take initiative to promote this kind of interaction. And most of people of my generation will do it with pleasure. And um, as I'm saying for myself, it's really a mutual enrichment. It's, it's, it's something we need to, 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 to promote. There are also some organizations which are trying to uh, promote, with say, dialogues for social cohesion, for instance. This is another space in which uh, people can, can uh, interact in this intergenerational thing. Um, there was a long comment on uh, uh, people living with HIV, LGBT people, and how they're being treated. Let me say the following. The reason I focus on us as people having to take responsibility for change is because, fortunately, in this country, legally speaking, there's no discrimination. You know what I mean? The legal framework accepts 
everyone with no discrimination at all. But discrimination happens because people did not change internally to embrace the values which are uh, uh, outlined in the law and the constitution. It's to leave the values of the constitution. And this can be done by people. And that's why I'm insisted today, it was deliberate actually, instead of focusing on institutions, because we hide into that instead of taking, I mean, the in, inwards looking and say, how are we transforming ourselves to be able to embrace, to accept, and to treat every single human being in him or her dignity as equal. And that takes each one of us to change. So, in your case, you were talking about NGOs. I think there's no other way instead without just confronting these organizations to say, you know what, you have established yourself as an institution, a social institution which wants to serve. So why are you doing this? Why are you discriminating? And sometimes they get resources from government or they get resources from other organizations like foundations, etc. It's precisely to allow them to serve and to serve well. So it is a process in which we have to educate one another to leave the values of our constitution. Then there was a long comment on uh, issues of UWC. I'm not qualified to, to comment on this because as you can understand, I just came for a few hours. I do not know the dynamics of what's happening in house. If it were in UCT, perhaps I would know better because it's my home as well. But let me tell you something. We need to improve communication and understanding between um, whether it's a faculty, whether it's management of our universities, our students, and this, the, the efforts which are being made, but also the limitations which exist to meet certain, certain standards in treatment of students. Because I think sometimes the communication is not so clear and complete for students to understand and to accept that yes, there are attempts which are being made and if it's not covering everything we would like to do, not deliberately because we don't want to. Sometimes there are problems of resources. I'm saying this on the basis of UCT, as, a, as I'm saying. We do have challenges as well. And most of times when you take, I mean, the task of explaining, including explaining the budget, to say, what is the budget we have? And how can we meet the needs of all students with the budget we have. So that we will know, you know, how far the effort is being made, although 100% of the things we wanted to do are not being met. But it, I don't think many times communication is as, in two ways, as it should. Because I would find it, uh, extremely difficult that uh, a, university, a South African university would opt to oppress the students. I would find it very difficult to accept, but I think we need to improve communication. Well, the last one was a comment. It was not really a question. Listen, if I had gone, for instance, to explain how this issue of workplace and the issue of uh, salaries, which can be, I mean, people are paid rightly. We have a big problem. We have a big problem. It's not only here in this country, in this country, but in other places as well. Is that, you know, the capitalist system which we embrace, and uh, our states have, uh, have not challenged that is that most of the objective is to make profit. And if you are to make profit, where you pay, how you pay, it depends on, at the end, this company 
is going to want to make profit. So I think there are systems which we opted without questioning the impact in the human. And we, we, we analyze is the economy. And sometimes when the economy grows, we don't understand, we don't analyze how the growing of the economy is meeting the needs and it creates a satisfaction from those who are working to make the economy grow. So numbers can grow, but satisfaction from people is not being met. I think we need to question the systems, particularly when we are not able to give the minimum to everyone. And this is a long, it's a long conversation. And this is what uh, my daughter there was uh, mentioning as MIND, the Mandela Institute for Development Studies. It's precisely to say, aren't all those systems which we have inherited and in which we are developed, are they just? Are they okay for us? Do they exist alternatives in which we can, yes, encourage, I mean, private initiative, but at the same time, protecting the interest of the workers because the workers are the ones who make the economy work. And the, work, the workers are really the reason why we have an economy. The economy exists to give satisfaction to basic needs of people. If they don't have it, then we don't need an economy like that. So there are huge questions which we could ask and we could discuss to see whether as Africans, again going back to some of the ways we have been in our institutional way of look, caring for one another, perhaps we need to bring some of those combined with the capitalist system, but to find something in the middle here, which is not which is not precisely what I think we have. One of the reflections of why this system is not working is precisely the fact that we have huge inequality. Huge inequality. Not only because the people do not earn what they would expect, but in the fact that we have millions and millions who simply do not have a job. There's something wrong here. There's a system which has to be rethought and analyzed anew. So I wouldn't go to that because this is not the, the case. It's just to say, you are making a point. But perhaps now I'll take it back to young people. I always like to do that. Look, you are unhappy with this system. But also, you are amongst the most privileged young people. Because you are in an university, you have education. Some of you are doing not only graduations, but you are doing masters, you are doing PhDs. Please take the time to rethink the Africa you want, and using the knowledge you have. One, you have the knowledge. Second, you are organized around students' unions. That's where you have to question what kind of Africa we want. How can we transform what we as a generation we did not dare to challenge. We inherited, we tried to manage it, and actually it looks like it's out of our control. We don't, we don't manage it as well as we would like to. Your generation then has, what the best? What are the alternatives? And take that courage to question in an organized way. That was the discussion tonight. No violence, not pointing on the fingers, you know? You just organize yourself and say, what kind of Africa we want? And in this case, you say, what kind of South African society we want? And how are we going, when we are in, in, at university, but when we go to our workplace, when we go back to our communities, how are we going to change this society so that as a legacy for your children, you are going to deliver a better South Africa, a better Africa? Some of us will say, with all the imperfections, you know, we delivered freedom. Dada Omar can say that. Freedom is what allows you to be at university today. Now, the second and the third challenges of how to transform society. 
please take responsibility, young people, particularly those of you who are privileged enough to be in an institution like this one. Am I making sense? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. We're going to listen to the choir again. Um, I think we've all been looking forward to hearing more from them. Um, and thank you again, Mrs. Marshall, for um, truly inspiring words and challenging us. Um, let's now listen to the Finance High School Choir um, performing Amaboro Boro. Back to the program. I'm going to now give um, the floor to Ms. Lakifa Omar, who will express a word of thanks on behalf of the Omar family. Yeah, this is a hard one to follow, but uh, please bear with me. First of all, I'm Latifa, sister of the late Dala Omar, and my family members, sisters, sisters-in-law, nephews and nieces, Dalla uh, San Rastam, they're all here in the audience. And on behalf of them, we say a big thank you to firstly, to the sponsors, to the guests who always come every year to each of the memorial lectures. And then especially to the Institute, which after Dalla left um, on becoming a minister, he carried on his work. Um, 
I think much like he himself would have done had he remained here as the head of the Community Law Center. I particularly want to thank Professor Stapler. I think he was the first director after Dalla left, and now, of course, Professor De Fisser, <coughs> for your energies, for your dedication, for your commitment to carrying out um, the work that Dalla himself, I think, would have loved to have continued, but other other needs, other <coughs> demands called upon him and he left the university. We, the family, know um, what soul searching it took and with how much regret he actually left the university and the community law center. So thank you to the university, Professor De Fisser, to your institute, and long may you continue and prosper. I also would like to thank the choir for your energy, your musicality. <laughs> I wish I could sing like you, but unfortunately I think if I did try, I would probably crack a good couple of <laughs> mirrors and lights and so on here. Yeah? So please, I ask that you continue with your musical endeavors. But also, like my brother would have said, do not leave your education behind. Um, your, your education in music might end up becoming your profession, but it might also be something that you do in addition to another profession that you, have, that you decide on. And that, that choice that you're going to make, he always stressed, was essential because you are going to fill the gaps you are going to be the engineers, you're going to be the scientists, you're going to be the teachers of the future South Africa. And South Africa needs people with all these skills to make it the great nation that we know it can be. So I think the lecture series uh, reminds us and the comments that have been made reminds us a lot of um, Dalla as an individual, um, more in this context of the, of the academia or of politics. But he was never a, a, a staid, straight-laced, serious individual. He was fun-loving, he was jokey, um, a family man, he loved his children generally, he loved his own children, the children of our family. He would crawl around on his hands and knees with them perched on his back. Um, he, he liked nothing better than to come home, change into something casual, and then sit and play with the kids or any visitor who just happened to come and check if he's at home. Even at the time when he was a minister, um, he had no objections to people just walking in on his house and um, shedding his supper and uh, often my poor sister-in-law was very much put upon to cater for the four or five extra people who suddenly rock up there at supper time or tea time and he would sit and chat to them like they were old friends and you know he wasn't this minister director of the community law center and so on. But he also, and as the lecture series and the list of distinguished speakers remind us, a very intellectual, analytical, intuitive, um, individual, sharp to the point, a listener very often before he speaks. The others could speak. He would sit there with his arms folded or sit, the rest of my is it like this? He used to sit like that and I see that characteristic in 
many of us, we have also got the same, or we do this, and he also used to sit like that, and for example, a group of students in the 1980s, the Athlone students, who would come to his house and discuss what they were going to be doing and so on. And he would just calmly sit there and say, yes, encourage them to speak, and you speak, and yeah, and what do you think, and what do you think? He never prescribed to them, but skillfully he drew out from them what he knew they should do. So it became their program, their ideas, not something that someone else, a Tala Umar or a Madiba, um, was the one who said, you must do this or you must do that. And say so they, they own those ideas and they own those programs. And that made, it, <coughs> made them work all the more hard and in a committed way to achieving their programs. And this was something that we often used to scratch our head about and say, how is it that he could sit there and um, if called upon to give a response, would come up with a short, sharp <coughs> praise of everything that had been discussed and then be able to say, okay, what do you think of us doing this? What do you think of us doing that? And people would scratch their heads and say, why didn't we think of that before? Why is it only now that it's come clear to us about what we should, should have been doing? And there was never any kind of rhetoric or cluster or pushing himself forward into the foreground, into the limelight. That wasn't him. But what he was is a deeply passionate and committed South African and African patriot. And whatever it took for him, from him, from his family, for him to do for this South African nation, which at that time was a nation in waiting, and for this Africa, which I think is still an, a, a continent in waiting, he was absolutely and totally committed to doing it. And he instilled that same kind of feeling um, in all of us. Unfortunately, I can't say I have the same incisive and brilliant mind that he had, but in my own way, I try to live up to his legacy. I also would, um, in, I think, have the temerity, Madame Michelle, to answer some of the questions um, or to ask myself and ask my family, what would he have said we should do to deal with these ills that South Africa is now facing? How do we, in our own spaces, try and correct or to start laying a foundation for a better community, firstly a better family, a better community, and then a better nation, and then a better continent. He never believed that you needed to be in a political party, on the stage, to ra 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 and so on. He was quite happy to tell you Work in your own family firstly. Communicate with everyone. Show everyone what is to be done, what is right, what is wrong. Next, in your street, become friends with the people who live in your street. We all live in houses with these high walls and burglar alarms and stuff. We often don't even know who our neighbor is next door, whether they are children or not, whether there's a dog or not. Um, get to know your street. Get to know the people in that street. Much like the implant, the, the uh, cells that you had, one street having uh, all the people in that street, all the homes in that street, part of this particular cell. And everyone knows everyone else. Plan of communication, and if anything happens, the entire street can be mobilized because there's a problem in this particular house, or there is illness, 
or there's been an accident and so forth. Similarly, in schools, we are parents, we are SGBs. Why are more of our parents, activist parents, conscious parents, why are they not making themselves available for election for SGBs? You find people who go there who like to go before for the name of it, rather than being genuinely interested in the welfare of that, those learners and of that school. And often the SGBs end up achieving hardly anything. So that's another avenue that, that we, in fact, should start exploring. Then there are civic, as we used to have civic associations, very active ones, prior to 1994. They used to take up the issues in our community, whether it was increased rentals in the uh, rental stock of the city council, whether there were problems with the services, whether somebody had been evicted. You remember this, those of you who are my age and maybe maybe a little bit younger, the boycotts that those civics actually um, uh, got going, the rantries and fatties and monies and so on. We don't do that anymore. Why not? It's, it's a perfectly, it's a powerful and perfectly legitimate weapon that we can use to, to show our discontent, our anger. We don't need to pick up the stones and bottles and so on. We can boycott those. There was the BDS who started the boycott of Woolworths, for example. And although many people didn't uh, join into that boycott, some people did with the result that there was some kind of effect, a uh, negative effect on Woolworths' <coughs> financial situation. So civics is another way of one organizing oneself and beginning to make a difference in your community. And then make sure that you get involved in the election of your local leaders, your ward councillors. Choose people not because they are ANC or because they DA or <coughs> but if they are ANC or DA, make sure that they're the right person who will do the work for everyone in that community, immaterial if you or whether you belong to the party that this councillor is, is part of or not. We are all too often we, we too happy to sit back and let someone else do the work. Same as in 1994, ah, yeah, we're in government now. Okay, we can sit back. The government's going to do everything. And of course, the government can't. Um, sometimes it can and it doesn't. So those are ways, I think, that Dalla would have said, get involved. And the sorts of things, I think, in a small way, that you can carry on the legacy of people like him, like Tata Madiba, like Govan Becky, Walter Sisulu, Oliver Campbell. And I think if all of us could commit ourselves to doing that, we can start making or laying the foundation. And it won't be easy and it won't, it won't be done overnight, but we will be laying the foundation and eventually growing into a movement which would have made people like Dalla wish that they were here on earth now and could be part of that movement. Thank you very much. Um, we've prepared a little gift for Grasha Vashel and um, I now want to ask uh, Uncle Freddy, if you wouldn't mind handing that over to, to Grasha, please. 